So we talked about uh, model selection, where our aim in the end is to obtain a model that generalizes best to unseen data. And we base our decisions on the evaluation of errors. Now what we're going to do in this video, uh, we're going to do a theoretical analysis of the type of errors uh, that we can expect our model to make. We'll see that the error uh, decomposes into an error related to the bias in the model, like a consistent error, and one related to the variance of the model in the sense that for every data set that I observe, my model will probably look slightly different. Okay, so what we've done so far, uh, we consider regression and we typically looked at the, the squared error. So we have this loss defined by uh, the quadratic distance of my target to, well, my model's uh, prediction. So this is uh, the squared loss that we've considered. And this loss is computed for all my observed data points, right? So we say, um, okay, so for a given input output pair, which we assume to be drawn according to some probability distribution. Really, so our, in our probabilistic setting, we, we say that our data is generated via this uh, probability distribution where some data points, some combinations of input output, output pairs are more common than others. And I'll go to a, an example in a minute. And actually we've seen the example of the sine wave uh, quite often, right? Where we assume this true model with some noise on it. So this really gives me a probability distribution in the end. Now, suppose we know the distribution that generated our data points, then we can actually compute the expected loss, right? Because, well, uh, let's say for one data set, we observe a bunch of, of data points according to some uh, probabilities. Uh, this gives me a loss. Um, if I again observe this data set, I get a new loss and my expectation over all possible observations would give me the expected loss. And so let's write it out. So the expected loss, it's really the definition of the expectation. So we integrate over our loss between my prediction and the target. And this is weighted for all, uh, uh, with the probability for uh, this combination of x and t uh, happening. So we integrate for all x and all t. Now I realize that it really takes some uh, getting used to, to this uh, probabilistic setting. So I'm really going to, in, in detail now, uh, make a drawing, go to an example to really make sure that we're all on, on the same page. Okay, the situation as follows. So we have this x variable and a corresponding target. And we assume there's a true relation uh, between the two. So we're going to stick with this uh, sine wave example uh, again. So this green function really provides the mapping from X to the corresponding uh, target. But in practice, we're not measuring this thing directly. We, me we make observations and there's noise on these observations, right? So sometimes we measure uh, T slightly above this true mapping, sometimes below. Um, so we have all these noisy measurements. Right, so, so far we assume that t was given by the sine of 2 pi x plus some epsilon noise. And this epsilon no noise was uh, Gaussian distributed uh, with a distribution with, with zero uh, mean and some beta precision. So that really gives us uh, a probability uh, distribution for observing uh, the variable t uh, for a fixed x. So let's look at a fixed x over here. Then um, the likelihood of observing a certainty or the probability of observing a certainty is given in the following way, right? So right at our uh, well at our true true target. We have the, uh, we most likely observe this value t, but sometimes we observe it slightly above, sometimes below, sometimes right over there, and sometimes really somewhere over here, but this is quite unlikely to happen. Okay, so for each x, for each fixed x, we have this conditional distribution um, given by this uh, Gaussian profile. Then of course we, we have to consider all possible x's, so um, we have all these distributions next to each other. And this really, in the end, gives me a joint probability distribution for x and t uh, jointly. So I'm going to make a drawing now, like a density plot. So I'm going to do this manually. So give me a moment to draw this. 
Okay, so I just drew this joint probability density, um, well, via this sort of density plot where darker means a higher probability and lighter means a low probability. So if I'm now going to sample, I'm now going to make observations of this process. I'm going to generate my data set consisting of these all these X and T pairs. Uh, I more like more often sample points close, well, in these denser regions and only very few times outside in these wide regions. So that's very unlikely to be observed, but still it could happen. Okay, so I have this joint probability distribution for X and T, and this tells me how likely I'm going to make my observations. And overall, uh, the most likely observations are made right over here. So this was this uh, sine two pi of X. Okay, now again, let's look back at what we're actually considering here. We want to compute the expected loss. So for the expected loss, I needed this uh, joint probability distribution and the loss for each possible X, uh, T uh, data pair. And this loss is really, uh, it's the loss of my model. I found this model. So that's what I'm doing, right? So I make these blue observations and I'm then I'm going to fit a model to it. Uh, it may look something like this. Okay, now let's let's figure out which model Y would, would actually minimize the expected loss. And let's do so by first looking at a fixed point uh, X, for example, over here. So let me unwrap that and draw it over here. So we have T, this was our uh, distribution P of T given X. So really the density along this line and it was centered on our uh, true model. And my particular model said, okay, uh, for this X, this is my prediction. So this was my Y of X. Okay, then what would be my expected error be? So really, uh, I'm considering this random process of randomly observing different data points. So one time I observed this uh, data point. So that, that gives me uh, this particular error. Uh, sometimes I, um, observe this data point that gives me a small error, but on average, I would observe uh, this data point. So the expected value of T given X. So for um, fixed X, the expected loss is given as follows. Right, so really I'm computing the loss, the expected loss for a fixed X uh, according to this uh, conditional probability distribution. Um, so these errors, I make them all the time and I'm just computing the weighted average according to these probabilities of these errors uh, taking place and that gives me an expected loss. Okay, now let's think about what would be the model Y that really minimizes the expected loss. Um, so let's, let's check that. So uh, what we're going to do we're going to minimize with respect to Y this particular thing. So we've done this before. So we take the derivative with respect to Y of X. So I considered this Y of X as a fixed uh, prediction well, of the loss and I'm setting it to zero. So this gives me the following. Right, so I took the derivative with respect to y, so this two comes up front and then I have t minus y of x. And what I then moved, did I move the t to the other side. And that gives me uh, this expression. And now we see here, I'm going to take the integral over t. This thing doesn't depend on t. This is a probability distribution. So this left hand side evaluates to y of x. And in the right hand side, I'm going to Actually, so this is the expectation of T, right? With respect to this distribution. So I can write this out. The expectation of T given X. So this tells me that the best possible model that I could make is given by the expected T given X. And this function actually has a name. It's called a regression function. Okay, now I must admit that this isn't a fully rigorous proof. Uh, in the end, where this y of x is really a function, a whole function, and I should maybe treat it as a whole function, but I just did a pointwise uh, analysis here. And that makes sense, right? So 
I'm, if I have a model Y of X, I'm going to make errors anyway, because one time my observation may lie over here, sometimes over there. So I'm bound to make errors. Uh, but really the best I can do, the best model I could possibly fit is really this expected uh, function. So the, the, the so-called regression function given by the expected T uh, given X. So now going back to my previous slide, so we just saw that the Y that minimizes the expected loss is given by um, the regression function, which is the conditional expectation of T given X. So that's really the best model I could possibly find. Okay, so now that we really have a good understanding of the type of data we're dealing with, let's take a final look at the expected loss. So the expected loss consists of this term so it's really the error that my model makes with respect to some observed x and t. And this error is weighted for all uh, possible, uh, with the probabilities for all possible x and t values via this integration. And if we think of this integration as, as two separate uh, things, so first the integration over t uh, really um, gives me the expected loss for a, a fixed x. And then the integration over all these x's gives me then uh, a sort of uh, average loss over my entire uh, function, right? So I make an expected loss at each point and then I integrate over X and that gives me the, well, the average expected pointwise loss. Okay, and now we're going to reason about our expected loss in terms of the, the best thing we could do. So this regression function or this uh, conditional expectation of T given X, that was really the best model we could find. and now we're going to decompose our error, well, using this as a reference. So I'm, and this is just a trick I'm going to do. This is a theoretical analysis to, to sort of look at the behavior of the error with respect to the best thing I can possibly do. So this was my expected loss. And now I'm just going to add zero to it. I'm going to add minus plus this thing. I can do that, right? So we can rewrite the expected loss in the following way, where we have uh, this term over here, which uh, contributes to this term and then we have this so this is really a definition of the variance right um, because the variance was the expectation of my uh, variable t with respect to its average value so uh, this term contributes to the variance but then of course also we have these cross terms so the product of this part and this part and it turns out that these uh, this cancels out so really you can show that now my expected loss decomposes in the following way. And if you want to verify this, take a look at Bishop 1.5.5. Okay, so we made a nice decomposition of our expected loss in terms of the best uh, we can do. And now in terms of our model, so our model Y, we see that only this term depends on Y of X. So this is the only term that we can influence by picking particular uh, models Y. And then we also have this term. Um, so this variance. So this is really the pointwise variance of my target variable and then averaged over all axes, right? And this term is non-zero. So this is a non-zero term and it's always there due to intrinsic noise in my data. So I always have some noise uh, generated by this epsilon noise. It's always there, so I'm always going to make errors. So my expected loss composed, uh, composes in a, in a term that sort of refers to this uh, bias, basically stating I'm going to make an error because my model is not optimal, and I'm going to make errors because there's uh, noise in the data. And this term is in due to um, intrinsic noise. There's nothing I can do about it. Okay, so nice, we see that our expected loss decomposes in this term, which we have in, a control over in some way and uh, some noise that, that is always there. And we also saw that the optimal solution, like the, this, the Y that really minimizes this loss is given by uh, the conditional expectation of T given X. But of course, this is in the general case, this is unknown, right? We, we really, in the general case, we do not know what our joint probability distribution looks like. And therefore we also don't know what this expected uh, uh, target value uh, given X is. Now, what we do know are our finite data set observations. So we're observing uh, a data point X1 with a T1 
uh, etc and we have let's say x and uh, n of these observations and this will be my data set now i can adopt a frequentist approach to approximating my expected loss and i can do so by making multiple observations like multiple data sets so i make one data set of observations i'm going to then again make all my observations and it will give me a second data set uh, and so on and now for each data set i can train a model um, maybe via maximum likelihood optimization or by using the maximum by optimizing the maximum posterior uh, whatever you do um, each data set will give you a, a, a different optimal model uh, this also means that if I compute the expected loss, then every time for each new model, I get a different expected loss. So um, I can really approximate this true expected loss by, um, well, <laughs> taking the expectation over all my data sets, right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to estimate the performance of the learning algorithm by averaging the expected loss over all these learned models for different data set D. So each data set model, each model coming from one data set has some error with respect to this ground truth and I'm going to just compute the expected error. So really this is what I'm going to compute. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to compute the expected loss of my expected loss over my data set. So yeah, it, it's getting a bit abstract, a bit feels a bit inception-like, um, but that's what we're going to do and what I just explained. So this means that my expected loss consists of this term, which is independent of my model, so it will always be there. And uh, this is the component I'm now going to focus on. So we have to, in some way, compute the expected uh, loss over all my data sets um, of my uh, model error with respect to the ground truth. And also here, we're going to do this trick that we're going to decompose this loss um, into a bias and a variance component by just adding essentially adding zero to it, so minus the expectation over my models plus the expectation over my models. Where really this term is going to be, um, well, my average model, right? So I have each data set give me a new model and I'm going to take the average of all my models. So this is the reference which we're going to, to look at. Okay, so let's write this out. We're going to compute the expectation over all data sets. Uh, let's first look at this term. So that's y d plus this term. And remember, we're just writing out the square of this entire thing, right? So uh, plus that term gives me okay, so that was this term over here. Um, so I'm just treating, I'm just bundling these parts, right? So uh, let's say a a plus B squared gives me A squared plus B squared plus two times A times B. And so this cross term, I'm going to write it out now. So that looks as follows. Okay, and of this entire thing, I'm computing uh, this expectation over D. Now I want to point out that this particular term over here. So all these expectations are, are just constant values, right? There's a constant value. So, and this, this is the only thing that still depends on D. Um, so if I compute the expectation over this thing, I'm going to compute the expectation of D of this thing. And this, it's the same as this. So really this term becomes uh, zero. So what I'm left with is the other two terms. Okay, so really I have to compute the expectation over this term. And what we see here, this is the expectation over each model relative to the mean model and that thing squared. So really this thing uh, refers to the variance over my models. And then what we have to compute is compute the expectation over this term. But note that each of these terms are just constants, right? So these are already computed expectations, so they're no longer depending on D. So um, the expectation of this thing will be just this thing. And what is what are we looking at? We're looking at the average over all my models. So this will give me my average model relative to my ground truth. So this is like a bias uh, squared. So this term corresponds to the bias uh, squared.
Okay, uh, so remember what we were computing here. We were computing this uh, expected loss over there. So let's just plug this in because we were focusing on, on this, uh, this error term over here. So let's plug it in. So we plug this in. And this gives, me, gives us that this expected loss decomposes in a bias squared, a variance, and a noise. So let me write this out. So for the bias, it's given by... So really my bias squared computes the squared error that my average model makes with respect to the ground truth, so with respect to the best thing uh, I can do. And uh, now my variance is given as follows. So this basically says for a fixed X, I'm going to compare the, I'm going to look at the variation over all my models relative to uh, my average model. So this is really the variance over all my models and I'm going to average this over all uh, X's. Okay, so we saw, and this is really a theoretical exercise, but we saw that if we are going to do model fitting, we can expect a certain loss. And this expected loss consists of a component called the bias squared, which uh, is due to the fact that my model or my average models are not close to, well, the, the best thing I can possibly do. So that's why I'm going to make an error, but I can also expect an error because maybe my fitting framework is unstable and gives me different models every time. So there's going to be variance among my models. Um, okay, so this really gives a bias variance decomposition of my expected loss. Now let's take a look at a, at a particular example. Uh, this is again a simulated experiment, right? Uh, we know how the data is generated. So we're again going to use this uh, sine 2 pi of x plus some noise. And also my x is going to be a random variable, uh, uniformly distributed from 0 to 1. So each point on the x-axis is equally likely to be drawn. And once I have such a point, then I'm going to draw a t according to uh, well, uh, this rule over here. Now, this also means that we know the ground truth. So the best possible prediction I can make is given by the expectation of t given x. And what would that be? Of course, that would be given by sine 2 pi of x. So this is our ground truth, and we're going to generate data sets uh, with this uh, now predefined uh, model distribution. So we're going to uh, generate 100, of, uh, 100 data sets each consists of 25 observations. And then we're going to fit models to these data sets. And our models will be trained using Gaussian basis function. It doesn't really matter precisely what basis function I use. This just conceptually, I'm going to model, um, I'm going to model the data with Gaussian basis functions parameterized with these uh, weights. And these weights I'm going to fit uh, using the data in each uh, data set. And I'm going to do so by minimizing uh, well, my error on this uh, training data set. And I'm going to regularize it with this quadratic rich regression term. Okay, so each data set is going to give me a particular model and I can compute the average over these models and that's going to be indicated with Y bar. Okay, so I'm really obtaining all of these models. I, I obtain one model for each of the 100 data set. So this red line, for example, corresponds to a model trained on data set one. Uh, this one trained on uh, data set two. And so, yeah, so I have 100 of these uh, uh, models and I'm actually plotting here. I think I'm only showing 25 of these models. So you see there's variation among the models, right? And then on the right hand side, what I show here in red, that's the average model. Okay, and then we saw before that lambda acts as a regularization parameter, right? So it su suppresses these large weights and there's a smoothing effect. So let's see what's happening here. For a large lambda value, I see that my models, they get suppressed towards zero, but I also see that there's very little variance among them. So now, now think of this as the expected loss in terms of our bias variance decomposition. For a large lambda, I have a low variance uh, along among all these different models, but I do make a lot of error because of uh, well oh, because of the bias. So I have a high bias. So each model looks the same, but each model looks significantly different from our ground truth. 
So it has a high bias. Then if I decrease lambda, so I sort of increase the flexibility or more the complexity of my model, uh, I see more variations uh, taking place among uh, the models. So I have a higher variation, but my bias is actually increasing. So I have a smaller bias. And then if we further decrease lambda, so I have an even, uh, so let's say a very high variance, uh, but I have a very low bias. So on average, these models look a lot like my uh, ground root. So that's a nice thing. Um, but each individual model um, is quite noisy. So I have a lot of variance in my models. So this tells me that there's a trade-off between va variance and bias. So if I have a low variance, I can expect a large bias. Um, so it's, it's not good. Um, but if I uh, set lambda very low, then I have a high variance, but a low bias. So I'm doing, on average, I'm doing a good job, but individually I'm doing a poor job. And we want to find a balance uh, somewhere in between where each model is close enough to the ground root uh, and I have little variation uh, among the models. So this was a visual analysis of the bias and the variance when uh, in, in the situation where I know how my data is generated. Um, but we can actually compute this. We can actually quantify this bias and variance uh, terms. We can actually compute it because we know uh, what a ground truth is. Uh, this was namely sine of 2 pi x, this term over here. And we also know how to average overall models, right? We can just um, average overall pointwise prediction of each of these models uh, that they obtained. And that's what we called um, or denoted with uh, y bar. Then the only thing we, we still need to do is to actually compute this integral over all axes. So really come up with a sort of average uh, error that we make, the average bias over all x. And we're going to do a numerical integration here. And we're going to do a Monte Carlo approximation of this integral, which means, uh, so this distribution is known. It was given to be a uniform distribution. And now I'm going to randomly sample uh, endpoints. So x1, x2, up to xn. And so this is really a sort of frequentist approximation of this integral. So I made all these observations for x and I'm just going to evaluate then this, this error term and take the average over all my uh, sampled points x. So from n is 1 to capital N, I'm going to compute the difference of my average model with respect to my ground root, which was the sine of uh, 2 pi x. And this thing squared for each x, n. Okay, so this is something we can actually compute. Now the same actually for the variance. So this integral was approximated with this Monte Carlo uh, integration technique. So I'm just sample a bunch of data points x1 to xn and I'm going to evaluate this term and I'm going to compute the average over all these uh, uh, measurements. And I'm reminding you here that the expectation over all my data sets of my model is given as this, right? So L was the number of data sets and I'm just going, going, to, going to compute really the, the average over all my models for a given X. So that writes out as follows, right? Because this thing was my average model. And so what you see here is really the variance among all my models, right? With respect to uh, the average model. Okay, so this is something we can compute and now let's plot it and see what's happening. If I train my models for different lambdas and I'm going to plot the corresponding computed bias and, and variance error. So that what you, that's what you see over here. With an increasing lambda, the variance uh, becomes smaller. This is what we already visually saw, but now we can actually compute this and show that this is actually happening, right? Um, but we also see that the bias error is increasing with lambda because we saw if we increase lambda, my solutions are pushed to zero. Uh, in the end, I just have that consensus. So I'm going to move away from, well, the true data actually, the, the ground truth. So my uh, bias is increased, but they have a small variance, meaning that each of my model is going to look quite uh, similar. So this is a very nice case of underfitting because they have low variance and a high bias.
Okay, then if we look at the other part of this spectrum, so with a very low lambda parameter, I am not doing much regularization. So actually, I can also so I, I can expect a lot of uh, noise among my models because my data now fully determ determines the model. And that's what we see. We see that the variance, so the red curve, actually increases with decreasing lambda. Um, but we also see that the bias, so the blue curve, really decreases. So I'm able to perfectly um, match my data. And this is a clear sign of overfitting. So I have a very low bias. So I fit perfectly to the data, but I also have high variance, meaning that my model is different every time because it just perfectly represents the data and my data is different every time. So I have a high variance among my model and this leads to overfitting. Okay, so um, this was all done in this uh, simulated environment, right? That we really knew the, the, the full distribution. And that also means that we can actually compute the, the precise test error. And that's indicated over, over here. So we can choose a lambda that optimizes the true test error. And the interesting thing is if we add the bias and the variance term, so the red and the blue term, we get this uh, purple uh, curve over here. And we see that it nicely follows the test error. And the gap that you see over here is actually caused by the, the intrinsic noise in my, in my model, right? Because we saw that the expected a loss composed of a bias squared plus a variance plus some noise. And we see actually nicely here that uh, there is indeed such a noise uh, gap between well, my bias and variance things that we measured and all well, the true uh, test error. Okay, so we already saw that there's this trade-off between uh, bias and variance. And we now just saw again that this is closely related to underfitting and overfitting and, and model complexity. So there's this, this trade-off. So I'm just going to write it down. So the trade-off between variance and bias. And it's nicely visualized in this figure, I think. Uh, so here, uh, the bias increases, my variance get lower, and at the point where they cross, so at the point where one term becomes more dominant than the other, this point is actually really close to the actual optimal uh, value uh, that minimizes the actual uh, test error. Now, of course, this was a theoretical exercise. Like in practice, uh, well, first of all, we don't know the ground truth. Uh, so we don't have access to this distribution. If we had access to the true distributions, then there wouldn't be a reason to really do model fitting. Um, but another thing is that in practice also, we do not want to split our data into L separate data sets, right? We want to work with the biggest data set as possible. And in that sense, if you were to have access to L separate data sets, uh, why don't you just uh, put them into one big pile, right? Because we saw that um, larger data sets lead uh, to less overfitting. And this concept of overfitting was closely linked to, to model complexity. Uh, so that, that's actually nice. Uh, so this gives us the impression that more data constrains the complexity. Okay, now a final remark, just by looking back at uh, these models. So we have, if we have a, for example, low lambda variant uh, parameter, I have a lot of variance, but on average, my model does a pretty good job. So this is a hint that actually model averaging could be a, a good thing to do. Uh, though in practice, we're not going to do that like by splitting our data sets into smaller parts because the best models are obtained with the biggest data sets. But we could do model regression in a Bayesian framework. And this is uh, coming up next.